Today's program is part of the award-winning series, Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter Weiss. In presenting the prize-winning children's author, Avi, we say welcome to a former Pennsylvanian. Where do you live now? Now I'm living up in Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island. Why do you use the single name, Avi? Oh my, that's a complicated story. Uh, <laughs> people are always asking me about the name. Uh, first of all, <coughs> it's a name given to me by my twin sister. So it's strictly speaking, uh, not my given name, but it's the only name. She gave it to me when we were infants, so it's the only name I answered. And um, that's the only name I've ever used. As for the last name, um, I'm not, I can only guess because it was a spur of the moment decision. Um, I think it's because my family was sort of opposed to my becoming a writer. They thought I wouldn't do very well at it. And I was annoyed by that. So, <laughs> I love it. I just didn't put my name, their name, on my book. So <laughs> I see. Oh, I see. Joining us is Carolyn Field, oh. coordinator emerita of children's work for the Free Library of Philadelphia. She remembers when you were a Trenton State College librarian. I was for almost twenty-five years. I was yeah. there. Well, it's nice to have a librarian on on the program with me. And I'm sort of curious, uh, why did you become a librarian? Well, I made up my mind to become a writer uh, when I was in high school. And um, I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, an overnight success. Um, I had to find a way to make a living, is what the crude truth is. And uh, I began working for the New York Public Library. Uh, I, I, should I, back, I should back up a little bit, because my writing in those days was for the theater, not mm -hmm. for young people. And um, I was doing a normal list of ridiculous jobs, carpenters, hamburger maker, you know, to anything to keep together. And I got a job as a clerk in the theater collection of the New York Public Library. Well, good. And um, within the first week that I was there, and I was truly doing nothing but filing there, um, in the first week that I was there, I discovered that within a few years they would move to Lincoln Center and that they would be expanding their staff. And thinking very quickly and being very broke in those days, <laughs> that week I enrolled at Columbia Library School mm -hmm. Night School because I decided that this would be a congenial place for me to work while I was pursuing my playwriting and that by having the degree Mm -hmm. uh, and being right there, I had a chance to move on to a regular position, mm -hmm. which is exactly Earn a what, living. Yeah, which exactly what happened. And I was there for 10, 11 years, something like that. So, yeah. Well, are, are any other members of your family writers? <coughs> well, my twin sister is a writer. Oh. She's a poet <coughs> and a <coughs> critic and a biographer. Uh, my parents wanted to be writers. My grandmother on my mother's side was a writer. And also on her side, two of my great grandfathers were writers. For heaven's sake! That's wonderful. My mm -hmm. stepson is a journalist, and my two sons, who are rock musicians, are, uh, they write their lyrics. Oh, that's so. There that's we all writing. are. You are really in the world of words, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And my wife, I, sh <coughs> I hasten to say, is an English teacher, and she writes and she teaches Shakespeare and so forth. How many books have you uh, had published to date? As of to date, um, 28. 28. 28. Well, that's 28. really impressive. Uh, when you were in school, did you have any problems uh, writing? Was it easy for you? Well, it depends on, yeah, the answer is yes. I still have you problems writing. I mean, writing's hard. But I flunked out of one high school when I was a kid and almost flunked out of another one, because, in part because of the writing. In fact, uh, in the second high school, I was only allowed to come back because I had tutoring. I was, my writing was so inept and so forth. So, You're a perfect example of the importance of determination. Stubbornness, not well, determination. 
I'm a little worried about fitting everything in into only a half hour here mm -hmm. at this interview, but um, I want to know, when you were in college, were you an English major? No. Nope. I did so badly in high school as an English student, I mean, in classes, and was so traumatized by English teachers, if you will, that I went, when I went to college, I avoided all English classes. Well, you had to take some. I took one, one? semester, and I, <laughs> and I majored in, in theater and history. Why did you start to write for children? I think I in ways that, uh, in a way that many people who do. I mean, I was writing. I was writing professionally. And then I had kids. And, uh, you know, like many parents do, they invent stories and tell stories to kids. But I was a professional writer in those mm -hmm. days. So, and indeed, the very first book that I published uh, was a collection of stories that I had told my my oldest son. I mean, that's a very typical story, as you mm -hmm. know. Well, and we're going to show a picture now of okay. that oldest son. Please introduce him. This would be Sean, and, and uh, he's a rock musician, and he lives in Boston, and uh, he struggles to make a living, and he works as a library clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Logical. Oh, in Harvard. My. And his brother in the next photo? And his brother, uh, Kevin. Um, he lives in San Francisco, and he also has a rock band, but he manages other bands, and uh, he's been on tour. He's recently. the younger one. He's the 25-year-old, yeah. I see. And uh, who is this and lad? And Gabriel. Gabriel is my stepson, who is the journalist. I see. And uh, he... Uh, Working where now? Well, he's actually... He just came back from working two years in Italy as, I uh, see. as a journalist in Rome. and. Uh, Truth be known, he's looking for a job, so I suppose I should tell his credentials or something. Maybe he'd get a job. <laughs> well, now should tell us, please present your lovely wife. She has an unusual name. Her name is Capellia, Capellia Khan. She comes from Seattle, Washington. Uh, second marriage for us both, and uh, she's a specialist in Shakespeare and uh, w women's studies and teaches at Brown University, which is the reason we're in Providence, Rhode Island. Now we have two views of your study. In the second one, there is an interesting creature atop the Felix. television monitor. <laughs> Not television, computer monitor. Felix, well, he sits up there. Uh, I often think he's there to give me advice, but actually he <laughs> he's a one of these cats who likes to be warm all I the time. I was going to say. Yes, and this warm. warm up on top of there. And he sits uh -huh. there, and uh, for a while he has his wonderful eyes, and he stares at me, but gradually, as my prose gets lusher and lusher, he gets very drowsy and falls Oh, asleep. I think it's lovely. I love cats, well, and I, I have, have yeah. one. <coughs> now, we've seen your, your family, <coughs> your studio, and your cat. Right. So let's talk about your writing a little bit. Now, you were initially recognized for your historical fiction. What aspects of uh, history do you like the best? Well, I, I was raised up... Um, in an environment and a family that said history was very important. Mm -hmm. and, and the focus was particularly on American history. Um, and then there was a book, I'm not sure, maybe you read, Carolyn, you remember the title. It was called, I think by Butterfield, called An Illustrated History of, uh, Illustrated American History, wh whatever it was. Mm -hmm. It was quite a wonderful book. And we got, I was quite young when we got this, but I used to love, I still have the book, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a wonderful, pictorial narrative of American history. Um, and I've always been interested in it. I, 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 why? I, I'm not, I, I can't be terribly rational about mm -hmm. it. But, uh, but uh, any aspect of American history, yeah, basically. Yeah, but I also read history of, of elsewhere. I like, mm -hmm. history is a story. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, it's, you know, there's the facts or what we think of the facts and the accumulated evidence. And somebody creates a, a, a narrative out of it. Right. And, and well, where, where and how do you do your research? Well, um, you'll understand this in a way that lots of other people won't. As a librarian, yeah. research is very easy for me. I don't even think of it as research, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because I can walk into a library and say, what I need to do is find out, um, you know, what did they charge for trains between Boston and whatever in, in 1870. And while that might seem an insurmountable obstacle for people who have not worked in libraries, um, it's not that I find it instantly, no, but I proceed it. It's not a great difficulty for me. 
um, when I was writing a book um, like True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, uh, I accumulated my own small library of books about ships and so forth. But if you look at my historical novels, and uh, this is crucial to this, I tend to write them in the places where I'm living. Yes. When I lived in the uh, Delaware yes. Valley, we noticed that. That's where I'm writing, mm -hmm. and so it's not as <coughs> if, uh, you know, I'm not writing about what happened at Valley Forge. Mm -hmm. I'm writing what happened down the road from Valley Forge, so that the evidence and the research is not uh, what time George Washington would get up and what mm -hmm. he would eat it wasn't and minutia. Right. It's uh, more a general sense of the history of how people live, which has interested me. I, I've never written an historical novel that's based on, say, an important event, which is a, certainly historical fiction of a kind, you know. Uh, you know but so you have more freedom. Yeah. It's about, it's about people who live at a different time, but I'm not terribly, con and I'm interested in the people. I'm not terribly interested in a particular event, if you will. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Rushing along a bit, sure. your first historical novel, Captain Gray, right. is just as exciting to read today as when it was written in 1977. Where did you get the idea for a pirate captain with whom the reader could feel a small amount of empathy? Um, how did that, I'll tell you how that book came about. It's a funny way. I was working as a librarian. In, at Trenton State College, and the faculty as a whole, for reasons that I thought were very good, uh, went on strike. I think we were the first college faculty ever to do so. Well, the first day was glorious, and there was much solida solidarity, and the second day was very dismal, because for the first time in my adult life, I didn't have to be at work, and I didn't quite know what to do, and then I suddenly said, you're an idiot. You can write all day. Now, I had never been able to do that. And then I, you know, it was upsetting. The whole experience was upsetting. I said I'd write something that was very funny. <coughs> so I thought I'd write a funny story about pirates, and I started to do that. But the emotions that I was feeling at the time, which were much more somber, began to take over. And by the time that strike was over, I had written a large portion of that book, Captain Gray. And it's, as you know, it's not a funny book. No, no. no. not by any means. That's why <laughs> when you said <laughs> funny book. So yeah. I had to go back. But I mean, that, that's, that that's was the, the occasion. The that beginning. The occasion. Hmm. Well, uh, the two of your books, uh, Night Journeys and its sequel, uh, Encounter at Easton, are both laid in colonial Pennsylvania and New right. Jersey. In fact, uh, Encountered Eastern won the Christopher Award, right. 1980, didn't it? Right. Congratulations. Well, uh, when you write books or read about uh, young, youthful, indentured, abused servants, your sympathy is usually with the servant. But now I have to admit, Ami, that in uh, Night Journeys, my sympathy was more with Peter York's a conscience-ridden guardian, Good. Everett Shin, the right. Quaker. Right. Uh, Whose name is taken from the great illustrator. Uh, Everett Shin. I thought it came from someplace okay. I knew. There you go. And in that book, you know, Peter thinks he knows it all and resents uh, uh, Everett Shin right up, up to the end. And do you, do you really think it's wise to write a book where the protagonist is a youth who thinks he knows it all? Well. I used to know it all, too, and you did, too. I know you did. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, that's fairly accurate. And, um, but I don't plan the books, you know. I don't, uh, the books that I'm working on, the way they flow out, the mm -hmm. way they develop, um, I do an enormous amount of rewriting. Uh, uh, you know, each book I write, I may rewrite 40, 50 times, over do and over again. Do you really? Oh, yeah. And oh, he's it, a perfectionist. Yeah. I no, know I don't. That. I don't think it's it's so much a perfectionist as trying to uh, understand and come to terms with the people that I'm beginning work, to know. It, with it, 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 to me, it's a little bit like getting to know somebody. You meet them, mm -hmm. you learn something, but you may meet them for the thirtieth time and suddenly realize uh, that there's something you didn't know, which ex explains what you didn't understand the first mm -hmm. day. You know, and the process is as much getting to know the people that I'm writing about. So uh, one's sympathies change just as they are with, as you get to know somebody. Uh, 
I have to um, uh, speed us up a little bit. Um, the book chronologically that follows encounter at Easton was the fighting ground. Mm -hmm. It depicted an action-packed single day in the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. It won the Scott O'Dell Historical Fiction Award. Why did you have the colonist corporal kill the young French boy's parents? Well, when someone asks me about why do I have, um, obviously the writer is in control of the situation. But in my judgment, being in control as a writer means knowing your character so well that you understand what that character would do. And um, it seemed to me that that was the logical thing. And uh, years after, I often wondered whether uh, people would notice uh, the similarity in personality t to that corporal, to uh, say, Ollie North. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was a similar character. Uh, somebody mm -hmm. who, at a given moment I I in this military context, uh, is very brave, uh, very committed, is capable of making hard decisions, but taken out of that context and still does that, becomes a person that is in some ways uh, contradicts the very values that he espoused in, yes. in a different situation. Yes. So uh, there's a contradictory. I mean, I was interested in that as a personality. Um, in the fighting ground, <clears throat> I believe you deliberately didn't translate Hessian words right. within chapters right. just at the end mm -hmm. of the book mm -hmm. so that right. people could feel that uh, the colonists' lack of understanding of German contributed to keeping Absolutely. parts aside. Well, you've, you have confirmed that that was your strategy. Uh, in The True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, which is one of my favorite books, and which uh, also was a Newbery Honor Book, and I really felt it should have won the Newbery Medal. I think it's just a marvelous story, because it's most unusual about a young girl on a ship in the 1800s w that with all the men and the things that happened, very, very fine girl, so on, with a surprise ending. It, it, it most unusual story. Now, what is it that makes you so interested in the sea? I I've always I lived near the sea. I've ah. lived a little bit in the Midwest, but I, I mean, I mean, I lived on the East Coast. I've lived on the West Coast. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you read you if you read American history, early American history, you, you you have to read about the sea and the ocean and so forth. And uh, again, uh, here I am living in Providence, mm -hmm, right. which was a great maritime center, and. Um, I mean, that's my only excuse. I mean, it sort of has a romantic appeal to me, I must admit. Well, now, uh, uh, Charlotte Doyle was published by uh, Orchard. That's correct. But you've also published books with Avon, Bradbury, Morrow, HarperCollins, Knopf. Uh, how, how is it that you publish with so many uh, Well, I think people companies. sometimes, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, you know, editors move around. True. And, for example, I mean, classically, uh, I worked at Pantheon essentially until the editor retired. Uh, and then the, the editor who I began to work with moved to Harper's. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she left Harper's. And um, then I started working with Richard Jackson, who was at Bradbury. And, and then, then he, he went, went to Orchard. Orchard. Uh, I, you know, writers uh, tend to stay with editors Good in that thing. sense. And that's been my case. And, and frankly, if, if if Richard Jackson moved to wherever tomorrow, I would hope that he would take me along, you know. Nothing But the Truth, mm -hmm. a contemporary novel that's shown from different viewpoints, was the Newbery Honor Book in 1992. Two years in a row you had Newbery Honor Books. That's some marvelous achievement. I'll get over it. <laughs> Where did you get the structural idea for Nothing But the Truth? Well, uh, <coughs> you know, in some ways I think of that book as a structurally like a mystery, uh, except it's not uh, who did it, is what happened. Uh, you're given, I in some ways, 
uh, again, as in a mystery, it's almost as if you were given all the pieces of the evidence. In fact, at one time I thought of using the title discovery. Discovery is a legal term meaning the, the information that is discovered about the uh, event, the crime, if you will. But I, anyway, I chose not to use it. And it just seemed that here I was writing about, what I th about how complex truth is. So obviously I had to invent everything because that's the only way to t talk about the truth is to invent it all. But basically that if I presented it from one point of view, one voice, it would, be, it would appear to be prejudicial. Now obviously the book is a work of fiction, but it creates the illusion in the best sense of the word that m the narrator, which is really me, who's hidden in this book, is totally neutral and it empowers the reader to make the connections. And people make different connections in that book. They come up with different who did what and why. Uh, so that's why I did it. It's a, it, it, it was a different kind of, uh, to evoke a kind of reader's response that they mm -hmm. might not necessarily have felt. Because the story itself, I mean, I, it could have been written as a sort of traditional narrative. But I don't think it would have been as interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, because the event itself is not in itself interesting, I don't think. It's not without interest, but it's the people's response to it, which is what that book is yes, about. Yes, it was very cleverly yeah. engineered, in mm. my opinion. Uh, Philip Malloy, the uh, protagonist, is not the most admirable character either. No. No. Um, why did you have him voluntarily choose to read S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders? Well, he liked it. <laughs> why? <laughs> because. Um, it seemed to me, I mean, this is the story, uh, The Outsiders, I mean, this is this great yeah. basic novel in our era uh, that, that helps define adolescence in our literature. And my thought was that, uh, and the story deals in part with uh, adolescents who are living without parents, as you know. And uh, just almost symbolically, if you will, uh, this is, would appeal to somebody like Philip. He wouldn't be unencumbered by these adults who are... <coughs> laying down rules and so forth, and uh, it just seemed to me it was in character. It was. And I also, it was important for me to, to point out to, to the reader that he was not opposed to reading. That's He's true. He's not opposed to literature. That's true. He has a reaction to this teacher and, and a, a traditional tale that he cannot relate to. Yes. That's what I was trying very, to, to very suggest good. in that. Now, one of your books, Something Upstairs, a mm -hmm. Ghost mm -hmm. Tale, mm -hmm. combined historical and science fiction. You had right. the protagonist, Kenny, enter the past, the 1800s, led by the murdered slave, Caleb. Kenny killed the slaver, pardon Willinghast, and changed the past. He killed the man to prevent him from hurting the, the slave. He changed the past and he calmed the haunting slave spirit. Whose Providence house did the slave haunt? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, we, I mean, people, you know, where do stories come from? We had been living in Los Angeles and moved to Providence, to that house. And pr Los Angeles, I need hardly tell you, is this ultra-modern city. And then to move to Providence, which is very much uh, an 18th century city, at least in the area that I live mm -hmm. in was truly like going back into time. And what that's the way the book begins. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're showing in the next yeah. picture. And what's home. more, yeah, this is a book is very popular, particularly in Rhode Island. And the local historical society teaches Providence history by using my Providence books. Oh. And every year they bring five to 6,000 kids to my door to stare at this house. <laughs> And they take pictures of They don't come in. You don't. Uh, yeah, they don't some of them try to come in. Oh, though, but you've really lost the privacy it of was address. It's a serious mistake. If yes. you ever write a book, don't put your own story. address. No. Just change the address. Uh, absolutely. I mean, big Two mistake. doors down. Big mistake. <laughs> Make enemies with your neighbors. That's it. Uh, the uh, same locale, Providence, in the year 1838, I believe, was the setting for the man who was Poe. 48, right? because 40. it's tied to the I gold rush. I beg your rush. pardon, right. 48. Yeah. Why did you write that strange book? Well, oh, it's too complicated to tell in a short time. But I mean, I, I came to Providence, and it's a wonderful city with a very rich history. And 
-hmm. And Poe, what the the historical context of that novel is absolutely correct. Poe uh, po was in Providence, and uh, the photograph, which is crucial to that whole mm -hmm. thing, uh, if I were to ask you to conjure up an image of Poe, my guess is that you would, there's a photograph that was taken in Providence that he took for the woman he wanted to marry, Mrs. Whitman. And uh, that's the photo that we tend to associate in any encyclopedia and so forth. It's, it's a late likeness of, of him. It's very haunting. And it just, he's an extraordinary man, I mean, he, in terms of American literature and yes. world literature. Yes. But he was nuts. Yes. And, uh, you know, and very complicated. And was he sick? Was he crazy? Was he just disturbed? Was he unhappy? He was all of these things, but he was also a genius. And um, he was an alcoholic was and so say, forth. An alcoholic. Yeah. Which yeah. Was a provocative <coughs> book. You know, and just, I just know kids are fascinated by this kind of personality and, well, mix them up with a kid and see what happens. Yeah. And to go from that to my next question, what uh, particularly humorous fan mail have you received that you can remember? I guess my favorite, I have two favorites recently. <laughs> this girl wrote to me and said, she's read Sh True Confessions of Charlotte Dole 16 times. She said yeah. it's the only book that she reads, it's the only book she'll talk about. And her mother has forbidden her to talk about it anymore. She's sick of it <laughs> and doesn't want her to read any other book. So would I please write a sequel to it so she could read oh. another book? So. I took that as a compliment. That's an idea, <laughs> to write a sequel to Sherlock Dore. You could. I never will. I know. It'll ruin the book. It's, a, it's for everybody to decide what they want what, that girl to do. I don't want to mm -hmm. tell them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other one, who was it? Somebody told me, oh, this is in recent, people would be interested in maybe. A, it, there's this great vogue of uh, the horror writing, you know, and, and this little boy wrote to me and said, uh, in school we're not allowed to read Christopher Pike or Stein. But we can read something upstairs. And he said he just wanted me to know that th my book was just as horrible as their book. <laughs> <laughs> what a compliment. Oh. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Oh, funny. Uh, Avi champions young people who show his lo mm -hmm. their sense of loyalty to him. In 18 states, they've nominated his books to win Children's Choice Awards. In 38 states, Canada and Denmark, he's conducted workshops. He chooses to go to special education classes from time to time and reveals his own spelling problems. At least 10 of his books have been widely translated. To our friend Avi, owner of Gentleman Cats, George and Felix, we say, Keep your creative juices bubbling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.